so our mathematician spotlight today is Dylan Thurston. Dylan Thurston is a, a professor at Indiana University at Bloomington. Um, and he studies many things. He studies topology, homology, algebra, the list of things that he studies is quite long. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about uh, mathematical genealogy. But so I don't yeah. think the sound is working. Oh, right. Because I didn't ever put the oh. Oh. So sad. It's got the microphone. Oh, it's good. It's it. it's yeah. it's got the built-in microphone. Because it has this like thing. That's uh, just a headphone thing. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah, it's it's recording. It's re does it have sound? It has the built-in microphone, so it'll be picking up just you know your regular. Yeah, your regular voice. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I forgot to get new batteries. That was my bad. Okay, I said to myself, batteries, batteries, and then it didn't happen. Okay, so in in uh, mathematics, there's this idea of genealogy. So um, it's going to be you this time because this thing is just not working. Um, and uh, okay, so so here's me. Not gonna work. I'm gonna have to do that all the time. Okay. Okay. So there's me, um, and then my mathematical father is my advisor, Rich Schwartz. And we've talked about him before. He's the guy with the um, the mathematical picture books, right? Um, and then his advisor is uh, this guy, Bill Thurston, who was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. He took the field of geometry and just revolutionized it. Um, and as you might suppose, Bill Thurston is related to Dylan Thurston, but not mathematically. They are related biologically. So Bill Thurston has a biological child named Dylan Thurston. <coughs> so it's kind of nice. Uh, when you go to conferences, you can say, oh, someone might say to me, oh yeah, do you know Ren? And I'd say, yeah, Ren is my mathematical sister. Or, you know, I might meet, there's this guy, Rick. I might meet this guy Rick at a conference and I might say, hey, do you know you're my mathematical uncle? So it's kind of nice. It's like every, all, most of mathematics is actually all of one big family tree. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then so you could say Dylan Thurston is my uncle, but not really my mathematical uncle, my mathematical slash biological uncle. So Bill, and then Bill Thurston, when I was in graduate school, I heard that he was sick. And I really wanted to meet him before he died because he's my mathematical grandfather. So I went and made sure that I met him. Um, it was really too bad. He died very shortly after that. Um, and then, but then I found out that his mathematical father, his advisor, is still alive. His name is Morris Hirsch. Oh yeah, so I have these pictures. So here's Dylan. Here's me. Then there's my mathematical father, Rich. Then there's Rich's mathematical father, Bill Thurston. And then there's Bill Thurston's mathematical father, more search. So, there you go. Mathematical genealogy. And I believe Morris Search's advisor is no longer living. So, it's kind of nice. So, everybody feels like they're all connected in one big mathematical tree. Yeah. Okay, so we've been talking about vector fields. Um, and we have, so far with vector fields, we can draw pictures of them. Today we'll develop some vocabulary to talk about them. So, um, so today we'll talk about divergence and curl. So these are two ways of measuring things about vector fields. Divergence measure how much stuff is created or destroyed, and curl measures how things are rotating or circulating. So if you think about, I think I like to think about vector fields as water, like the way that the water is moving. Divergence tells you whether you have a spring or whether you have like a sinkhole. And curl tells you which direction the water is circulating. That could be in two dimensions or it could be in three dimensions if you had some sort of crazy whirlpool thing going on. Um, but first, um, I thought I'd give you one extra tool to think about vector fields. So to draw um, a vector field, there are two options. So option one is the thing we were doing before, which is uh, plot vectors for representative points. So in particular, plot points, plot vectors for many representative points. So this is what we did the other day. We had our favorite vector fields, x comma y, and negative y comma x, and you just picked a bunch of points and plotted the vectors and tried to get a holistic sense of what was going on. 
And for x comma y, things were all just leaving the origin. And for negative y comma x, things were rotating. Um, that's option one. Very good option. And now I'm going to give you an option two, which doesn't work all the time, but when it does work, it's kind of nice. So option two sometimes works. Um, look at f as the gradient of some function f of x comma y. <laughs> so then we could draw level curves for that function, and then the vector field would be the gradient vector field for that. So let's do an example where it works. So for example, let's let f of x, y be um, y comma x. So one way that you could figure out what this vector field looks like is you could just plot a bunch of points. Perfectly good. Um, here's another way we could do it. So we want to find some function f of x comma y so that f is the gradient of f. In other words, so that um, y comma x is the partial of f with respect to x comma the partial of x with f with respect to y. So this would mean that the partial of f with respect to x is y and the partial of f with respect to y is x. So this is like clues. And you want to find a function that will do both of these things. Can you think of a function that would do these, these things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. f of xy equals xy. So it's written on the sheet. Um, but also, you could just perhaps think of it. So if we, if once we have a guess, we could check it. So if your function was x times y, let's check it. Take the derivative with respect to x, and we get y. Take the derivative with respect to y and we get x. So it works. Um, if you weren't able to just think of it, um, another thing you could do is anti-differentiate both sides. So we anti-differentiate the left side with respect to x, and we just get f. We anti-differentiate y with respect to x, and we get y times x plus a constant. And in this case, since we're different anti-differentiating with respect to x, it could be any kind of function of y. Because if you had some function of y here, and you took its derivative with respect to x, it would go away. And the, so the same here, we can anti-differentiate with respect to y. f is x times y plus any function of x. And then if you set these functions equal to each other, well, we'll just get x times y. It turns out we didn't need any constants any, or any functions of either of the other variables. So our function is just x times y. OK, so we have found a function whose gradient is the, the function that we want. Now, um, draw level curves for f of x, y, and use it to draw the gradient of f of x, y, which is f. So let's do this. This is a, a vector field, uh, level curves that we've drawn before. So f of x, y equals x times y. I want to draw level curves for that. OK, how about level 0? If x times y equals 0, x is 0 or y is 0. So I've actually already drawn that. That's here. These are the level curves at level 0. Then at level 1, um, x times y equals 1 is a hyperbola. So it looks something like this. There's 1 and 1. And then if x times y is 2, it's a hyperbola further out. So here's 2 and 2. And then if it's uh, how, how about let's go negative? Um, so if we have negative 1, you go here, negative 1, negative 1, and then red, here we go negative 2, negative 2. Okay, so this is the idea of the level curves for this function, and we can keep them going. I'll just make them in red, even though they're higher numbers. Maybe I'll make these in blue, they go like 2. So there are level curves for this function. Okay, now we want to use, now we want to draw in the gradient. Because the gradient, this is all just like helper things. The gradient is what we want. So now gradient vectors, x, y, um, are perpendicular to the level curves. 
because you, it's the gradient is the direction of greatest ascent. So you would not want to go in the direction of the level curves because the level curves are the directions where you're not changing at all. Um, and in direction of increase. So let's start with the axes. If I'm here, for example, on this level curve at level zero, I want to, my gradient vector is perpendicular and it points in the direction of increase. So it's either, it's either up or down. It's like if I go down, my function value is decreasing. So I'm going to go up. So here we go. And these are all perpendicular. And I'm noticing that my level curves are getting closer together here. So I'm drawing my vectors getting bigger. And then the same thing down here. I want to go perpendicular in the direction of increase. So I have vectors something like this. And then how about these points here? Like maybe let's do this green curve next, level curve of level two. Our gradient vectors are perpendicular to the curve and in the direction of ascent. And they get, they're bigger as the things get closer together. So same thing down here. And then how about for these red curves? So this red curve, for example, we want to go perpendicular to the curve and in the direction of ascent. So here's negative 2, here's negative 1, here's 0. So this is the direction of ascent. So our vectors go something like this. That was supposed to be straight. Vectors don't bend. Um, and then how about this one? I guess it goes the same kind of idea. Okay. So. If we had just plotted all these vectors, it might, so imagine that the colors went away. If we just plotted these vectors, it might be kind of hard to see what's going on. <coughs> but the idea of gradient is using the level curves and seeing it as a gradient is that you can have a holistic picture of what's going on. So seeing this function f of x, y equals x times y is like a mountainscape. It's high in these directions and it's low in these directions. And so you can imagine um, the gradient vector is the direction of greatest increase. So it's kind of like if it rained on the mountain and you took a video of it, you saw all the rain going down, and then you watched that video in reverse. So it's like the opposite of the way that the rain would go. So the rain would go the opposite of sort of these, these type of ways. So you can see how things are moving in your gradient vector. And these things, if you just draw the path that water would take, these are called flow lines. And they give you a good sense of what's going on. So again, it's not the case that every single vector field is the gradient of some other vector field, but it turns out it's convenient when it is. Um, and so, yeah. So what's an example of um, a vector field where we won't be able to use the strategy to kind of draw it out? I so a vector field where this isn't the gradient is, I think, negative y comma x. Why does that not work? And so negative y comma x, that's our, one of our two favorite vector fields. That's the one that just goes around uh, counterclockwise. And the reason that doesn't work is because if, if you think of it as gradient vectors, they point in the direction of increase of the function. And if you follow the gradient vectors around, you'll just go in a circle. So it says if you just go in a circle, the function is increasing, 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 in increasing, increasing. And that's not possible because you get back to where you started. You've been increasing the whole time. OK. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this one, um, this lack of a negative sign makes a big difference. And it just says if you increase, you can just increase, and then you, all, you never get back to where you started. So there's no contradiction. And also additional question. Um, so in this case, we assumed that our, our constants uh, with respect to y and x and our functions were, were 0. Um, but we do know that like the, the integral or when we integrate a function, it's not going to be just you know, x, y plus 0. Um, so how, do we, how does our vector field or our diagram take into account like the infinite possibilities of constants that we could have had? Yeah, we could have had any constants here, um, like if it was plus 10 or something like that, if they were both plus 10. Yeah. Uh, or if this, if this 
function had been x times y plus 10, we would have gotten the same partial derivatives. Um, but it's okay, it would just be like your entire mountainscape was just 10 meters higher. And all the direction curves would be the same. All the vectors would be the same. Other questions or ideas? Okay, okay, so um, we'll just, we want to have some words to talk about uh, these things. And so the two words that we'll learn today are divergence and curl. So, divergence. So the diver divergence measures how much stuff is created or destroyed. So if it's positive, stuff's created, it's like a spring. Um, if it's negative, stuff's destroyed like a sinkhole. Um, so the divergence of a function f, so we can call it divergence of f. Let's suppose our function, our, our vector field f is p, q, r. So in this case over here, p would be y and q would be x. And r, well, r would be 0 because it's just a two-dimensional thing. But we're defining it in three dimensions just in case we have a third dimension. It is the partial of p with respect to x plus the partial of q with respect to y plus the partial of r with respect to z. So that's what, that's what the divergence is. And amazingly, this measures this how much stuff is created a destroyed quantity. Um, so... So it measures the net flow So if you have a point and around this point things are coming out like this uh, then for this point in the middle uh, divergence is going to be positive because things are coming out things are being created uh, we call this a source like a water source. On the other hand, if you have a point and things are generally going in locally at that point, so I'm drawing it as though it's important that the vectors everywhere are coming in, but actually we just care what's happening right there. Um, the divergence at this point would be negative, and we call this a sink, like a, like a kitchen sink or like a sinkhole. Um, and another thing that can happen is just things just pass by and don't get created or destroyed. So if that's the case, um, at that kind of a point, the divergence is zero. And there's no special name for it because things are just going back. OK. Um, so this is kind of fine to calculate. Um, but I'm going to make a bit of new notation so that we can write this slightly differently. So we're going to define this operator uh, Doppler symbol to be the vector consisting of partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z. Okay, so it's not a vector in the sense that we think about vectors usually. A vector usually is like a, an arrow, like a direction and a magnitude. This is just an operator. It's convenient to put these three derivatives in a box. Because when you put these three derivatives in a box, then you can say that the divergence of f is this operator dot f. So let's write that up. That would be partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, dot the three components of our vector f, p, q, r. Where we just, we're thinking of, we just, this is just a name for whatever function of x, y, and z this is, whatever function of x, y, and z this is, whatever function of x, y, and z the third component is. So if you multiply this out, you get partial with respect to x, p, plus partial with respect to y, q, plus partial with respect to z, r. And usually I'd say it's partial with respect to x times p, plus partial with respect to y times q, but it doesn't really make sense to say partial times. What we really want, we want to think of this as like partial of, you're applying the partial to p. So this is partial of q with respect to x, partial of q with respect to y, plus partial of r with respect to z. It's a convenient way of notating things that will come in handy. Okay. Okay, so
so let's try this out, this notion of um, divergence. So let's try it on our two favorite vector fields. So let's compute the divergence of our two favorite vector fields. <coughs> now, I'm sort of telling you that these should be your favorite vector fields. I would never tell you what your favorite kind of ice cream should be, or what your favorite sport should be, or who your best friend should be, but I'm going to tell you who your favorite vector field should be. So the reason to have these uh, favorite vector fields is so that you have a vector field in your pocket. So that any time you have a new notion or any time you have a problem that's hard, you can be like, wait a second. Instead of trying this on a complicated example, let me try it on my old friends. The vector fields x comma y and the vector fields negative y comma x. So I'm telling you, they're your favorite. They're your favorite. The more I tell you they're your favorite, the more they'll become your favorite. I think that's how it works, right? <laughs> okay. That's uh, not actually how it works in life, but maybe it works here. Okay, so our first favorite vector field is um, f of x comma y is x y. And our other favorite vector field is g of x comma y is negative y comma x. So we'll compute the divergence of both of these guys. So x comma y, that's, the, that's like the big bang vector field. That's anywhere you are, you compute your vector to the origin, and you just draw it out. Something like this. Okay, and now I'm going to stop being so careful because I'm going to try to just draw the rest of the picture. You get the idea that everything goes out. Okay, so there's, there's one favorite vector field. Let's compute its divergence. So we could think of it as x comma y comma zero if you wanted to because there's just nothing going on in the z direction. So for this vector field, p of x, y is x u of xy is y, and r of xy is 0. It's just telling you what these p, q, and r mean. They're nothing fancy. They're just the names for these three things. So the divergence of f is partial of p with respect to x plus partial <coughs> of q with respect to y plus partial of r with respect to z. So let's do it. Partial of p with respect to x is 1 plus partial of q with respect to y is 1 plus partial of r with respect to z is 0, so it's 2. Okay, so this tells you that stuff is being created. It's a source. Probably not surprising because it is exactly the kind of thing where, where everything is coming out. Um, maybe, maybe we're not surprised that the origin is a source, but maybe it's a little surprising that every single point is a source to the exact same extent that the origin is a source. So. If you pick another point, like maybe um, this point here, notice that you have a vector coming out, and you also have a vector coming in, but the vector coming in is smaller than the vector coming out. So more stuff is coming out than is coming in. So this pink point here is also a source. So it tells you that every point is a source. With amount two, whatever that means. Yeah. At the origin, there are no vectors going in, right? At the origin, there are no vectors going in. But All the vectors. There are no vectors going out. There are also no yeah. vectors coming out. It's true. So how do we get two? That I don't look Oh, how do we get two? Well, I think we should think about it not just at the point, but in a, like a tiny neighborhood of the point. What's going on? Not just at you, but like in a tiny neighborhood of you. And in a tiny neighborhood of you things are coming out from you. You don't have to think about like the unit circle around you or like a big neighborhood, but just the type of that. So when we had the neighborhood approaches a point, it's going to be the same neighborhood. The limit as a neighborhood approaches a point is that things are going away from you everywhere, no matter how small you take your ball to be. Yeah. Um, does diversions always have to be like a constant number, or like if your vector um, field was defined in terms of multiple functions and you take the derivative with respect to only for one, yeah. then you should get a function out of it and you try to add up all these functions, your diversions would be 
as a function of other variables, right? That's right. In general, the, div the divergence is going to be a function of okay. x, y, and z. Okay. Just because our vector field is so simple, that's why it came out to a constant. Okay. So sometimes the if it's a source or if it's a sinkhole can be defined based on where we are in the vector field? That's right. Okay. So in, for a general vector field, you'd have some point, points that were sources, some points that were sinks, some points that were neither. Yeah, and it would depend on your point x, y. Okay. Uh, so we'll do simple examples all the way through, and then at the end, I'll, I just wrote down a complicated vector field, and I'd like you to take the derivatives of it and just see that they depend on x, y, and z. The kernel and the divergence depend on x, y, and z. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, let's do this for our other favorite vector field. So our other favorite vector field is the vector field that goes in a counterclockwise circle. So you plotted the points for these the other day. Um, they're always perpendicular to, the, to these axes going counterclockwise. And then at intermediary points, things go in a rotation kind of a way. Okay, there we go, here we go, things are rotating. Okay. Okay, so there's our other favorite vector field where things just rotate. And we would hope that if divergence is a well-defined notion, like a good, a good definition, that it's not gonna be as much as over there. Because it doesn't look like things are created and destroyed, it just looks like they're moving in a circle. So let's try this. So you can think of this as negative y comma x comma zero if you want. So P is negative y. <coughs> Q is x, and R is 0. And so the divergence of f is partial of P with respect to x, plus partial of Q with respect to y, plus partial of R with respect to z. OK, let's do it. Partial of P with respect to x is 0, because negative y with respect to x is 0. Partial of Q with respect to y is again 0. And partial of R with respect to anything is 0. And with respect to z is 0. So it's zero. So there's nothing being created or destroyed anywhere. And you can just think about at the origin, if you put, yeah, if you were putting, you're collecting things here, everything's just rotating. If you would put your little block here and consider what things coming in, things coming out, they'd be basically the same, coming in, coming out, and things would just be getting pushed along. So um, nothing, this tells us, is that nothing is created or destroyed anywhere. So divergence, it seems like it's well suited to this function, but it just tells you, eh, this function is boring. But this function is not boring. Something interesting is happening. Things are rotating. So we should have a measure of rotation. So um, we'd like to, to measure rotation, because this thing is rotating, or circulation, you might call it. And for this, we use curl. OK, so let's talk about curl. So for the curl of the vector field F, well, the formula is a little bit complicated. I wrote it down there on your sheet. It's a, it's a, bunch, it's a vector composed of a bunch of things. Um, but you don't have to compute that formula. Here's the idea. The clever way of doing it is that you, we take our novel operator and we take the cross product with f. And this is how we compute the curl. So what that means is we take i, j, k, then our operator, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, and then our function f, p, Q and R for our vector field. <coughs> so if we write this out, this is the first component. So I is partial with respect to Y of R. So partial with respect to Y of R minus partial with respect to Z of Q. And then for the middle, it's the opposite of partial with respect to X of R minus partial with respect to z of p. And then the last one is partial with respect to x of q minus partial with respect to y of p. Okay, so this formula, I, I had not memorized it, so I could not write it down. But when you, you 
think of it as a cross product, it's much easier to remember. So curl gives you a vector, whereas divergence gave us a number. So this curl vector is a vector in three space. So curl of f is a vector in three space. Um, its direction is the axis of rotation using the right hand rule. So suppose that this room, instead of being a room full of air and oxygen and the things that we need, was actually a snow globe. Okay? And we shook it, and now all the little bits of snow are circulating around, and we're measuring where the snow goes. Okay, and at this point right here, the, the snow is generally going in this kind of a direction. So if I put my fingers in the direction that the snow is going, my thumb points in the direction that the curl will tell us. So if we computed the curl at this point here, it would give us some vector. And if I put my thumb in that direction, I'm not sure which vector it's going to give us, but I'll put my thumb in that direction, and then my fingers will show me the direction that the snow is moving at that point. So that's the idea of the curl vector. Um, and so a vector is two things. It's got a direction, so we said that's the direction of your thumb. And the magnitude, or the length of the vector, is the speed or the strength of the rotation. So if I computed the curl at this point of our snow globe, and I, my thumb was in the direction of the rotation, fine. If the vector was very big, it would mean that the snow was really rotating very fast here. And if the vector was very small, it would mean things were just gently rotating around. So is this like a, a fan blowing air or something? Yeah, it's like a fan blowing air. So if the fan is rotating in some direction, you could say that the curl tells you which way the wind is blowing out of the fan. And then so depending on how fast are, it rotates, the, the speed of the air getting projected will be different. Yeah, if, okay. it, if the fan rotates faster, the wind coming out of the fan will be stronger. And I guess you can say, so we talked about the other day, last time, that clockwise and counterclockwise are not well defined in three dimensions because if I have this thing going like this and I look at it from this side, it's going counterclockwise. Maybe I should do it this way. But if I look at it from this side, it's going clockwise. So the notion of counterclockwise and clockwise is not well defined, but I guess you could say if you are at the end of the vector looking at the thing, it's always going counterclockwise. Um, so when we're talking about rotation of um, like snow or something like that at a given point, it's yeah. like, are we, like, like, because I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking about at a point, like it's multiple like things moving around. So are we thinking in the, na like, in the neighborhood of it that they're moving, like other points around it are moving or? Yeah, you think of in the neighborhood of the point, how are things moving? Okay. So many complicated things could be happening but you're interested in your one little point, you zoom in on your one little point, and you see how things are rotating there. Yeah. So let's test out this notion on our two favorite vector fields. So um, I'll erase a bit of our work here, and then we'll just compute the curl. So, in fact, perhaps I'll erase this divergence calculation. So the curl of f is, okay, I do i, j, k, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, and then my function is x, y, 0. And let's just do a reality check beforehand. Things don't seem to be moving too much, so we don't expect much curl, if any. If we got like a curl of 100, we'd be surprised. Okay, so let's do this. So, the first component of our vector, the i component, is the determinant of this submatrix. It's a kind of a determinant, but remember we have to think about this as an operator, not as multiplication. So we take the derivative with respect to y of 0, 0, minus the derivative with respect to z of y, also 0. Okay, so the first component is 0. Then for the next one, it's negative of the derivative with respect to x of 0, which is 0, 
minus derivative respect to z of x, which is 0. So it's negative 0, so it's 0. And finally, derivative with respect to x of y is 0, minus derivative with respect to y of x is 0. OK, <coughs> so this is 0. So it tells you that nothing is circulating anywhere. So I think that that's maybe that's clear uh, at the origin maybe that nothing is rotating, but it's all it's true everywhere. So if you think of like putting a little block of wood somewhere, dropping it into this whirlpool or snow globe or whatever your favorite metaphor is, um, the arrows on both sides are basically the same strength. And so it's just going to get pushed away without rotating. Good to know. Okay. Okay, let's do the curl calculation over here. So I'll erase a bit of our divergence calculation, and we'll do a curl calculation of our other favorite vector field. So the curl of G, okay, once again, it's I, J, K. Those are vectors. I did not put vectors over here. That was bad. There, those are vectors. Um, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z of our function, which is negative y, x, 0. Okay, let's try it. So it's a vector. The first component of the vector, the i component, is the determinant of this little submatrix. Partial with respect to y of 0, 0, minus partial with respect to z of x, also 0. Okay, so that's 0. Next one is the negative of partial with respect to x of 0, that's 0, minus partial with respect to z of negative y, also 0. Okay, those are 0. And finally, partial with respect to x of x. Ah, it's 1. We finally got something that wasn't 0. Okay, 1 minus partial with respect to y of negative y. This is negative 1. So 1 minus negative 1 is 2. 2. Yay! Okay, so this tells you that the vector is 0, 0, 2. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and then the z-axis is coming straight out of the board. So I take my thumb and I put it in the direction of this vector, 0, 0, 2. Here it is. And now my fingers go in the direction of rotation. So if you put it at the origin, that's certainly true. Here it is. It's going counterclockwise. But actually, it's it's claimed that it's true anywhere. The curl is true everywhere. I never plugged in the origin. So it means if I put my hand at this little block of wood here, the, it's also rotating counterclockwise. Um, and the reason for this is if you, the, the vector on the right is bigger than the vector on the left. So it's getting pushed more on the right than it is on the left, so it's turning. So this tells us that every point has counterclockwise circulation of the same strength or speed. So if you had this whirlpool going around and you put your little block of wood anywhere, it would always rotate at the same it would rotate at the same speed. Some of the places it would get pushed around also. It would be rotating at the same speed. Kind of cool. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah. So in the z axis we have we have some curl. But in the x and y axis we don't. Right? So so the fact that this says that the curl vector is zero zero two means that the axis of rotation is always pointing in the positive z direction. So all the rotation is happening in the xy plane. Yeah, no rotation is happening in the zy plane, and no rotation is happening in the zx plane, because our vector field lives in the x plane. So we're just, particular vector fields are not snow globes, they're just two-dimensional. Yeah. So this uh, brings up a general principle, which is that if you have a two-dimensional vector field, your curl always points in the z direction. So for a 2D vector field, so f of x, y 
is like P Q, or you could think of it as P Q zero, because you can just put in a zero for the z direction, if you like, if your vector field is just in two dimensions. Um, the curl of F is always zero, zero, something. It's always zero, zero, something. It's always in the z direction. And if C is greater than zero, it tells you that things are moving counterclockwise. And if C is less than zero, it tells you that things are moving clockwise. Uh, because if C is greater than zero, it means your vector is pointing in the z direction out, so things are going counterclockwise, math direction. And if C is negative, it means you're pointing into the board, so things are going clockwise. <coughs> a more complicated vector field on the bottom of your sheet, and I'd like you to take the derivatives and just see what happens when things are more complicated, but you don't always get a constant. And then check with your neighbor. Okay. It looks like most people have got the divergence. Can someone say what it is? Y sine z. So y sine z, that's the derivative of this first part with respect to x, okay? Plus one. Plus one, the derivative of the second part with respect to y. Plus x y. Plus x y, yeah, the derivative of this last part with respect to z. Nice. And so notice that this is a function of x, y, and z. So the divergence depends on where you are. You plug in different x, y, and z's, you get different numbers. But it's always a number. So this is a scalar function of x, y, and z. OK. And I know the curl, there's a lot to do. Uh, did anyone get the first component? Yeah, Daniel? Um, x, z minus x, y cosine z. Xz minus xy cosine z. Is that right? Other people get that? No? Competing solution? Someone else? Yeah. Xz 
plus yeah. yeah. e to the z? Gosh, I guess we'll have to figure out. No, no, that, no? that one's right. I did it wrong. That one's right? OK. Thanks, thanks for volunteering. So yeah. good. Good job. Yes, good. OK. So I guess the first one. So this one has a lot to do because you have to compute this determinant thing, and there's a lot to do. OK? Other people have this one? It seems right. OK, fine. Second component? Yeah. Uh, I got x, y, cosine z minus y z. x, y, cosine z minus y, z. Y, z. Is that right? Yeah. Did you uh, did you include the negative sign for the j calculation? Actually, yeah. Good. Okay. And then the last one. So I have the last component. Yeah. X, uh, x sine z plus j. Plus e to the z. Does this seem right? Okay, so um, uh, so I I did not compute it, um, and if I had, I wouldn't have remembered. So I won't stake my life on this being correct, but I will stake my life on the idea that these are this is a vector function of x, y, and z. So this always gives you a vector, and it depends on where you are. Okay, thanks everyone.